So good evening. All right, we're going to try that again. Good evening. All right. Um, on behalf of KPCC and LAist, welcome to the Crawford for tonight's event. We've been shy about the branding, so I hope you know what we're here for, what the event is. It's the Big Burn, um, which we're super excited about. Brand new podcast from LAist Studios that just dropped. Thank you so much. I assume that you are at least roughly or pseudo familiar with that podcast, and that's part of the reason you're here. If not, you'll have a whole lot more to know about it, and hopefully you'll go back and listen to it. Um, my name is John Cohn. I oversee live programming and events for KPCC and LAist, and we're so glad to have you here. By round of applause, I'm very into like audience participation, and you all seem very excited about that already. Um, by round of applause, how many of you are joining us for a live event for the first time tonight? Just round of applause. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, the questions are now going to get harder. How many of you are members of KPCC or LAist? By round of applause. Excellent. Thank you so much. You, you honestly do. I'm, we say this a lot on air and in every other way. You make everything we do possible. So thank you for your membership and your support. If you weren't one of the people that applauded just now, which was an excellent prompt, um, you can call 866-888-5722. You can click and join at kpcc.org or las.com. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for one of our newsletters to tell you about all the amazing things that are happening on air, online, in person, and on demand. Um, we do a slew of events. Uh, we're doing LAS Studios events with Jacob. We did one with Adolfo Guzman Lopez as part of uh, Imperfect Paradise. We have some others that are teed up that we have yet to announce, but you'll be the first to find out if you sign up for our newsletter. We're also in a year-long series called Public Radio Palooza, year-long series of live shows celebrating the folks that make the magic in public radio. We have a couple more in that series that wraps up in December. There's some newcomers to public radio, Ira Glass and Jad Abumrad. They're going to be doing an event with us. You probably never heard of them, but I hear they're good. You should come check them out. We'll be at the Theater Days Hotel. And then we're also excited to present in this very space, uh, Farai Chidea and Our Body Politic will be doing a live show in December. So check that out. Elias Studio shows voter game plan we take elections and governance and civics and democracy very seriously hopefully everybody in the room does so we'll be doing events to support that as well as our ongoing excellent coverage from our award-winning newsroom kpcc and las so all those things and others can be found in the in the newsletter so sign up i think i've hit that sufficiently hard um we're really excited you're here. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to your host for the evening, the host of Big Burn, none other than the one, the only, Jacob Margolis. Jacob. Thanks for coming. Very excited to get to it. I'm Jacob Margolis. I'm a science reporter uh, and host of The Big Burn here at uh, KPCC. And I don't know if you could tell, but lately I've been a little focused on wildfires uh, for a variety of reasons. One is, uh, as all of you know, they've gotten pretty bad and pretty intense. Um, and I've wanted to know why. And that really drove a lot of this podcast that we have, that we just came out with. The second reason is, like, I am exhausted. Um, and I have wanted to know whether this that we're experiencing, the fires that are burning violently, all the smoke we are forced to breathe uh, all the time, it feels like now, is, uh, is just, it's, if that's just the future and that's what we're gonna be experiencing from here on out. So, you know, honestly, it's, it is a lot to process, it's a lot to understand, and uh, that's why we made the big burn, and I think we have a trailer for you right here in case you haven't heard it. I'm Jacob Margolis, host of The Big Burn, How to Survive in the Age of Wildfires from LA's studios. As a science reporter, I cover wildfires every year. And every year, they just keep getting worse. Okay, I understand. Okay, I'm sorry, we can't even take the calls anymore. So this is a structure? Why is all this happening? And most importantly, what can we do about it? PG&E has an accountability problem. There's a part of colonial debt that they need to challenge themselves to understand the history. See us here, your children, as the seven generations of the future to restore the land and use the greatest tool left to us, fire. The Big Burn is a show that will challenge what you thought you knew about fire and will teach you how to survive and even thrive in the age of wildfires wherever you get your podcasts. So if you want to understand what the science is behind what's happening, 
uh, what the future is going to look like and how, you know, maybe we can end up in a better place, please go subscribe to the show. Episodes come out every Wednesday, and this week, in case you haven't heard it, is all about why our giant sequoias, which are these fire-adapted trees, are uh, now burning down and being, being taken away. And it really explores what we can do to save them. So today, though, we're going to be having a chat with some experts who know a ton about this sort of stuff. And we're going to be talking a bit about what is being done in the front line, like what it is like being on the front lines of these new fires, uh, the history that brought us here, and the sometimes uh, very, I guess, problematic decisions that we're making as a society that is exacerbating this problem. Um, and we will have time to get to questions, so you can submit them on your phones. There is a website you can go to. It's called Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. You can enter the code big, just write big burn in the little text box that comes up. Um, and you can, we'll, we'll get to them later in the show. So uh, I want to introduce my guest for today. First up is Teresa Greger. Uh, she's a professor of American Indian Studies at California State University, Long Beach. She's of Kumeyaay descent and Yaqui descent. She focused on she is focused on California American Indian experience and tribal resilience, and she is also our native cultural content reader for the show. So please welcome her. And thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, Derek Bart is a retired fire captain for LA County Fire, where he fought fire for over three decades, who we've been turning to for advice about prep and survival with wildfires. And please, Derek, uh, yeah, uh, uh, please come on out. Yeah. Hey, yeah, of course. And uh, Stephanie Pincel, who is a professor at UCLA's Institute of Environment and Sustainability and director of the California Center for Sustainable Communities at UCLA. Uh, she works on the issues of land use, urban planning, and human decision making. So thanks for coming. Thank you all, thank you all for coming. I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, and I want to start with uh, understanding kind of like how bad things have gotten on the ground. So I want, I want to turn to you, Derek, because you have a lot of experience on the ground with fire. Um, you fought fire for decades, including on the Woolsey fire, which I'm sure a lot of you remember uh, back in 2018, burned from the San Fernando Valley all the way to the ocean. It was, a, it was a pretty big deal and very difficult for a lot of people. So if you can, can you give us a brief idea of what it was actually like on the Woolsey fire for you and folks you worked with? Okay, so for a little perspective, um, I live and work in a place called Westlake Village, which is the westernmost station in L.A. County. Right next to that is Thousand Oaks. To the north of us, um, well, right next to me is the 101 freeway. North of that is the 118. Fire started over at San Suzanne Pass in the 118. Um, we had 70 mile an hour winds that day and the day leading up. So when fire hits the ground with wind at 70 miles an hour, it has a tendency to throw any of the leftover burn, which we call an ember cast, it, it pushes it ahead. So, you know that game Whack-A-Mole? Uh, it, it, as that ember cast goes out there, it becomes like the game Whack-A-Mole where the embers set down into backyards and into homes and you can never get enough resources to uh, catch up to this fire as it's running its horse down a canyon or whatever path it's taking. And it usually has a pretty predictable path. If you look at some maps, you'll see maybe a 100-year history of when the Santa Ana's come, they're going to take a certain path. And so you can predict it to a degree, and you can get resources ahead of it, but you can never have enough um, in a wind-driven, low-humidity event. And so do fires today, have they, do, you, do they feel more intense to you than they did when you started your career? Uh, they certainly have been in the past, uh, I'd say, past 20 years. Um, when you're looking at acreage that's burning up, you know, three, four acres a second, you know, we're talking 44,000 square feet is an acre, right? And you're getting three to four of those a second. Um, look at the Thomas fire. So yeah, it, it, it certainly does. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about the science. I want to mention some of the science behind the worsening fires. Part of it is climate change. Um, obviously, it's, uh, it's made our heat waves worse. It's exacerbated our droughts, essentially drying everything out more easily, extending the fire season to longer periods 
of the year. And so we are coming up on Santa Ana season. It is just about, it is just about here. Um, and you know, we've traditionally seen these wind-driven fires. And I, wanna, I wanted to go for some practical advice from you, Derek. It's just for people in the audience and at home, I think it'd be good to give them uh, what, if a fire is burning nearby, it's something kind of basic, but if a fire is burning nearby, how do you know if it's time to leave? I will uh, simplify this for you. You'll, you will remember this. Where the smoke goes, the fire goes. So if you come out and you see that smoke going away from you, I'm not going to say don't worry about it, but I'm going to say a chance is going to continue on that pattern given that we know we're going to have a sustained Santa Ana condition or weather, whatever weather event. So understand this. Um, without a Santa Ana and fire on a hill, fire is going to travel with the topography. With wind behind it, it's going to go in the direction that wind is pushing it. It may go downhill. It may come up. It may go in one direction and reverse at night. Um, so, what kind of conditions should people leave their house in to like make it uh, as as conducive to wild uh, firefighters as possible, so that Gr maybe they could save it? You mentioned the pool sign to me in a previous yeah. conversation we had. Great, great question. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, be prepared way before the season starts. Have your have your game plan ahead. Uh, even in the garage, have a eight and a half by eleven piece of paper, um, categorizing the most important things you need to grab, so you can go in there, look at it, and grab it. And then the last thing, unlatch your garage, so that the automatic garage door is unhooked, so that when we come there, if we make a decision to stay at your property, and that fire comes down on your property, and it's coming at you, and it becomes too intense for us, we may back out and take refuge inside your garage uh, for a while because we can survive inside a structure that's on fire um, better than we can with a wind-driven wildfire interface taking us without our protective gear. The other thing is if you have a swimming pool, please make a notation of that on your curb. Have a picture of a blue pool and you know a picture of water or swimming pool. Um, next to your address there. The other thing is make sure your address is visible from the street. Uh, summer's over now. You're taking all your uh, um, <clears throat> covers from your chase lounges. Don't put them underneath your uh, windows because when that ember cast comes, it's going to look for that. It's going to light on fire. It's going to bust that window. It's, and while everyone's evacuated, your house is going to start off. It's going to catch fire and nobody will be there to be able to report it. So it won't be until we see black smoke that we know we have a structure that we need to get to. And, uh, you know, I, we can't get deep into it today, but obviously prepare your defensible space because it also makes a really big difference and can save your house, which is clearing a lot of brush and burnable stuff from around your property. So, yeah. Can I make a note? Yeah, of course. Uh, if you live in what we call it a wooey or wildland urban interface area, you should every year, at least in L.A. County, you will receive a notice in February. It says, hey, time to get ready for fire season. And it has an image of your house and if it's on slope or where it is in relation to uh, the interface and things you need to do, the distances you need to have. Get ahead on that. So then when we come out in May or June, um, if we have any other suggestions, we can give that to you and you can have that completed. But there's a lot of things you can do to help us. We will never turn down a home unless it's just something where we would die. An example of that is sometimes there's a lot of heavy canopy and, and when that fire comes through, there's nowhere for us to survive. We're just going to we're going to be a marshmallow in a campfire. And uh, we want to protect your property, and we need you to partner with us to do that. So when we come out, it's for your benefit. It's for your property, and it's for our life safety as well.
So we do have more useful tips uh, on the wildfire survival guide brochure that you may have grabbed on your way inside and probably can grab on your way out. But I want to get back to the cause of these fires, that some of it is absolutely climate change, but there are deeper reasons as to why the problem's gotten so bad, including that we've been treating our for the way we've been treating our forests for the past 170 years. So for much of that time, and this is very much the forests that, we're, that I'm thinking about, you know, we've been suppressing fires. That has led to a major buildup of fuel, and unhealthy forests can carry really intense big fires uh, that essentially are so hot that they are able to moonscape entire groves. So before we started suppressing fire, just about all the fires, uh, I would say like, you know, starting in the early 1900s or so, our landscapes across the state had been taken care of for millennia by Native Americans. And so that's where I want to turn to you, Professor Greger. If you can, can you give us an example of how and why Native people put fire on the landscape, the variety of different reasons, especially in the forested areas? Yeah, so we, we first peoples of uh, this land, um, and they're numerous, there's over 574 federally recognized tribes and numerous others that are unfederally recognized, like the Tongva people whose land we're on today. Um, fire was a tool. Um, most native communities have stories about how they get, were given fire as a gift from uh, the creator and um, the proper protocol to use fire. We have fire keepers. Um, in terms of landscape management and forest health or ecosystem health, um, it was it was born out of a combination of I'm sure you know experience observation, but out of necessity. Um, Native peoples like we are today were very mobile. We may have had a primary village site as our main home, but none of us stay at home all the time unless we're told to in a pandemic. Um, and we travel, right? We travel for various reasons. So to so to have food resources or to hunt more easily, um, fires would be set along trails. Um, in order for growth to come back so that you know you could easily attract game or have plant sources that you could gather and have a meal. Um, fire was also set um, underneath the oak tree. That's what unites most California American Indian people is that we're acorn eaters. Um, and I believe that's what Hoop, the Hoopa tribe, that's what their name translates to is acorn eater. Um, and that was a, a plant for nourishment for us. And if you burn the fallen leaves, you know, slow crawl burn underneath the oak trees, it acts as a natural, the good smoke acts as a natural pesticide and can keep like the little vermin that might get into the acorn, you know, from penetrating and just kills them off. Um, and then of course it reduces that, that mulch. Um, so in keeping the landscape sort of clear, um, it allowed for people to live better, right? Um, we could gather our medicine sources um, from our plants um, get to water sources more easily. The water has more time if there's less buildup to like seep into the earth and re replenish our reservoirs. Um, so it was a tool. Um, we see it as a gift, um, something that's sacred, something that's used in our ceremonies as well. And I understand that you grew up on a reservation yourself. And how did, I'm curious how your family, how your family used fire specifically. So this probably sounds odd, but it's really, it's not in my life because this has been my experience. I grew up on the Santa Isabel Indian Reservation. It's about two and a half hours from here near the mountain town of Julian and near Mount Palomar. We have an observatory like Mount Wilson. Um, and we can actually, from my parents' house, see every morning I would wake up and I would see Mount Palomar on top of, or the observatory on top of Mount Palomar. And we did not have electricity when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. Um, we weren't the only ones in our community. It was just, we were sort of rural for San Diego County and um, it just didn't make it to the part of the reservation where I lived. So fire was a part of my life since, you know, I was a little kid and I was always taught to respect it. I could start a fire in the fireplace when I was eight years old. I cooked in the fireplace if we ran out of propane. Um, we had uh, heaters, everything was contingent upon sort of a pilot light and, and a fire. Um, and my dad, would regularly, uh, we called it drag our yard because he made his own little, he didn't have a tractor, but he made like a pool and created that defensible space that Derek was talking about. Just, you know, as a precaution, we would burn like our paper goods in a little, you know, rusted out trash can on cool, cool days. We did our own burn piles, um, you know, and I was probably like just the entire 80s when I was growing up. Um, that was our way of life. and. 
I was never afraid of fire. I, you know, like I said, I saw it as a necessity and something that we always had as sort of a backup, like to like modern living. You know, we had kerosene lanterns and Coleman lanterns and um, candles. So it was just it was just a part of my my growing up. And some of my, you know, many of my relatives and cousins too had the same experience. Yeah, and so a lot of the um, fuel buildup that we see today like I mentioned, really began uh, in the late 18, mid to late 1800s across the state. And our fire, kind of this fire suppression really uh, machine that, that uh, kind of set forth and, and allowed a lot of this fuel buildup over time in a lot of these forests uh, really began around like 1905 or so with the creation of the US Forest Service. And I think it's really important to bring that up because it's important to understand how we went from uh, fire as a constant on the landscape here to uh, f fearing fire and fire as the enemy because that wasn't clearly wasn't always the case and so I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about what obviously what happened in the 1850s um, which is in part also when California outlawed uh, prescribed burning or well, cultural fire honestly I think it started really like 150 years before that when we first had the arrival of Europeans um, that came to this territory and, you know, implemented the system of colonization and settler colonialism, you know, the biggest differences between the first peoples of the Americas and the people of Europe um, that were arriving here and looking for resources and, you know, ways to India and China for trade was a religious difference. And so the underpinnings of those doctrines um, and the perceptions of fire that they carried within them really started this fire suppression in the Americas. Um, and we can think about the, the settling of what would become the United States in two ways. We're taught in grade school that it starts on the East Coast, right, and progresses because of manifest destiny to the West Coast, but really it was a bilateral operation because Spain, right, came up as well through Mexico, and Juan de Cabrillo was here in 1769. They had already um, established missions all along Baja California, and so the 1769 um, building of um, the mission in San Diego was just a continuation of that process. Um, and so they had already had this understanding that natives put fire to the ground. If you read any of the historical records from those early um, expeditions of Spanish um, folks arriving here, um, they're, just, they're just littered with seeing smoke. You know, they're sailing along the coastlines looking for these natural harbors and inlets to get to the land. Um, but they could see the village smokes like everywhere. Um, and so fire was just a part of the First Peoples' life's ways, way of life. When the mission system was implemented, um, the, the priests and the, the soldiers that accompanied the missions um, put a stop to it because they feared it, right? They saw it, the fire as having a connotation of being linked with something that was evil or satanic or with hell, um, and that created the fear. Um, and so it was really this religious and cultural difference that created that suppression. But with it, we know, you know, the landscape started just going into its natural state. Um, and that's also a big fallacy about Native people that we didn't manipulate the landscape. We didn't propagate food sources, but we really did. It was just in a way and with techniques that were different from those that were being practiced in Europe at the time. And so as fire was banned and uh, basically and excluded and there was a genocide and, you know, endorsed by the California government as well as the federal government, uh, you know, it th by the early 1900s, you know, if you look at um, uh, the density of forests start to increase. Um, where stand, you know, Yosemite didn't look anything like it does today, uh, where there is a massive amount more fuel there. Uh, and that is one of the things that is able to sustain these high severity fires is what they're called. And so fires that burn so hot that it just wipes everything out. And so the fires that you're talking about were quite often, and correct me if I'm wrong, but were quite often uh, low to moderate intensity, which were fires that, um, you know, would go ahead and clear out a lot of the duff, clear out a lot of the, uh, the buildup on the forest floor, and it would be done consistently over time. Um, and uh, without all of that extra fuel there, 
the, it would lick the bigger trees, but it certainly wouldn't moonscape everything. And so that's actually one of the biggest things that we're seeing right now, especially in the forests, and one of the, I'll spoil, I guess, episode two a little bit, and one of the reasons why giant sequoias are being especially hard hit, and I talked to some of the managers up there um, for the episode and since the episode about uh, the sequoias that have been the hardest hit. And in one of the most recent fires, it was actually a case where they have actually been treating a lot of the area with prescribed fire for some time. That area did well, but it came from an area with no treatment. And in the area from no treatment was down, like down slope from the area that got hit. And so it basically turned into this gigantic fire on this untreated area, which came up and started to hit the trees, even in the treated area. So the treatment of the landscapes has been really, really important, and it's really important to understand the different types of fire we're also talking about, which we go into, we don't have time tonight, but which we go into really a lot more in the podcast. And so, you know, we have this basically through the 1900s, this growing sentiment of like building a large fire suppression machine partially around uh, wanting to grow, you know, preserve timber, timber stores throughout the state as well, putting lots of resources into putting a lot of fires out. There's the 10 a.m. policy from the Forest Service in the 1930s, which basically says all fires out by 10 a.m. the next day, and they put a lot of money into all of this suppression. And so a lot of that also, by the time we hit the 1960s, grew along with developments that we were expanding and we were, you know, building more and more out into the wildland, into areas that have fire off and that still have fire, like the Santa Monica Mountains, which is, uh, you know, Professor Pincel, uh, I mean, you study urban land use and planning, and I was wondering if you could draw a direct line for me, like, how does where we've chosen to develop and build communities contribute to some of the problem that we're seeing today? Not a very hard line to draw. Yeah. <laughs> you have 35 <laughs> Thank you for seconds. Setting up please, that please question. go ahead and do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, what what is, you know, kind of just obvious is that because we have been able to build out into more rural areas because people like open space, they like to feel like they have nature around them, and so on. Um, what we've done is allow people to be exposed to extremely high hazard, and it's a really um, a, a kind of a big paradox that Americans who value having privacy and lots of space actually allow themselves to be in situations of extremely high danger. And there are other aspects of this, um, this desire, and that is, you know, you have to drive really far, you have to take all the materials up to those places. It's an extremely profligate way to build your urban environment. You know, the, oh, let's see how far I can go, right? Um, and, and what we've been able to do, because things have been so cheap, land has been cheap, gas has been cheap, timber has been cheap, water has been cheap, everything has been cheap, we have not really in, understood the actual cost of that kind of land development. So today, we are facing a situation where things are not so cheap, and we have a legacy of not only habit, expectation, but inscribed land uses. And you see this process going on still today where a developer may have bought a piece of land um, on, the, on the urban fringe, there are a number of examples around this region, um, applies to the county or the city, the county. They have entitlements because many years ago this was zoned for urbanization, so today 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, if you think of Tohon Ranch, I mean, they've owned that land for a really long time, um, they go and they, you know, they call in their entitlement, and it's very hard for localities to say no because there's a huge amount of pressure for development, right? We don't have enough houses, we don't have enough housing, um, and we need jobs, you know, the whole, the whole litany of, of reasons why it makes a lot of sense to build in these areas. But in fact, um, there are other alternatives that then get completely uh, foreclosed once we d have that kind of path dependency built in. So it's, a, it's also a historical legacy of this idea that there's an endless frontier. Actually, we still, uh, there's still a lot of that. And the fact, too, that, the, that those who develop those lands don't pay the consequences of that development. So they're not on the hook for the firefighting, right? Who's on the hook for the firefighting? We're on the hook for the firefighting. They just walk away with their profits. 
so in, and it's, it's really kind of a stunning situation to realize that um, they can continue to transform this land into houses in very, very dangerous places for people, and they just walk away uh, uh, free and clear. There is, I mean, there is a growing discussion, uh, a, a constant ongoing discussion about the uh, reconsi like reconsidering where we're allowing people to build within the state, right? And, uh, and also, I am, I am quite curious why we don't have more stringent, especially uh, uh, laws around prepping homes for fire, uh, especially when it comes to like vents, right? So one of the things you can do is put one fourth inch vents on your home and it prevents embers from getting inside, uh, theoretically, and that would be quite Well, great. the code is starting to ad yeah. adapt to that. So I think that's, that's, that's happening. Mm -hmm. but, but the problem is everything else that is already on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So the cost of retrofitting homes to fire um, protection standards is very, very high. So not only is your fire insurance going up, but are you gonna also then have to pay for retrofitting all of those homes to many much better standards, double paned windows, for example, getting rid of wooden roofs, making sure your eaves are, um, what's the word, blocked, or there's boxing them in. You know, there's just a, a lot of retrofitting to be done. And you know that legacy means that there are a lot of people out there who moved there who don't have that much money and they have very, very little alternative. So I think that there is a growing awareness that we have to change our land use patterns, but it's an enormously politically difficult situation. Mm -hmm. If you have people who own private property and who have looked at the general plan and the general plan says it's zoned for housing and then all of a sudden, you know, in 2022, we say, no, you can't do that anymore. It leads to a lot of very gnarly legal battles around private property rights. Um, so it's a, it's a very difficult transition that we have to, that we have to um, accept, that we have to engage in, because otherwise we're all paying for that extremely expensive fire protection, uh, fighting those fires, and that money, by the way, is no longer available for control burns. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's this kind of Faustian bargain. You, you want to protect all of those, mm. those houses, you want to protect ecosystems, but you don't have any money left because you spent all this money fighting the fire so that people wouldn't die. Mm. So what is the, sorry, Terry. You know, I, I was gonna say, we haven't even talked about the biggest problem. Please. We're a desert. Yeah. Where's the water? <laughs> We keep building. We have a building addiction, mm -hmm. and we like to keep kicking the can down the road about the water issue. I think that's the next season. Uh, everybody, <laughs> write in. Everybody, everybody, go ahead. You're you're spoiling it for me, Derek. Uh, everybody, go ahead and uh, contact KPCC and let them know. Um, but so, uh, so what I am, what I, one of the things I am curious about, um, Professor Pincel, is. What is the, so, uh, you know, without getting, I guess, uh, too deep, uh, what is, what, what is the consider, like, do we need to have a reconsideration of values and around this? Like, I, I don't know where this ends up going ultimately, like, where we end up as we continue to lose neighborhoods and homes and, like, where we, I guess, where do you see this going politically in the next 15, 20, 30 years? That'll vary a lot depending on the jurisdiction, that's for sure, but, Here's, here's the thing to realize. Um, there's a lot of space in the already built environment for a little more density. And we're not talking Manhattan. We're not talking Singapore. We're not talking Hong Kong. We're talking about reasonably sized you know, fourplexes, not the stuff that's being built now. Because what we're doing is just loading a bunch of density on the transit corridors and leaving everything behind that is in interstitial, right? And so if we were to accept that we're uh, social humans and that we can live in cities in a very nice way if they're well built, then there's a lot less pressure on that urban fringe. There's a lot of savings in that. You already have all that infrastructure in there. You may have to expand the, the grid a bit. You may have to expand the power line. You may have to expand your sewer lines but it's all there. You're not, 
pouring new asphalt, you're not building new infrastructure, and you use a lot less water in denser environments. You have better transportation, it goes on down the road. But we haven't made that transition in our heads yet, I think, to, to, to have the modesty to realize that the planet is kind of finite and we're having really bad impacts, including these enormous fires. So I would say that there is some movement in that direction, but it's a very slow one and it's a much too slow one uh, to mitigate some of the worst impacts in the short term. Remember, you can go submit your questions uh, for this for this panel um, up at that website that I can't remember the name of, but you can use Big Burn on, on it. And um, so I want to go ahead and I, I also want to turn to you, Professor Gregor. Um, so we're talking about, we're kind of clumping together a lot of different uh, land use policy, a lot of talking about fire kind of across all sorts of different landscapes and fire here in like chaparral ecosystems, which is what we have here, is much, much, much different than say fire that is in uh, like the Klamath Mountains um, up in Northern California near Humboldt for any of you that have been around there. Um, but you now have the state and federal government uh, turning to Native Americans in a big way for guidance and for actual like land treatment to bring back fire to the land to go out and do cultural burning, prescribed burns, and, and really, uh, this, is, this is written to the state plan, Newsom's talked about it, the feds talk about it, and they're asking Native Americans to help, but I'm curious, like, where, what does the government need to do to make sure that cultural burners are well supported? Because when I went up and talked to a number of the folks heavily involved in, especially fire politics in the state, they told me that they are very much not, but are being asked to do all this work. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts about that. It's a difficult question to answer. I think the, the, the strategies are changing. There, is, there are conversations occurring about how do we incorporate cultural burning, traditional ecological knowledge from Native practitioners um, and Native people that have been doing this continuously in their homelands illegally, right? Some of them would get fined or be threatened with jail if they got caught doing these types of burns, um, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago. Um, and so I think it's it's sort of bringing together, um, you know, the, the fire fighters and the people that are developing our fire plans and our um, protection plans um, and sort of changing our mindsets around that, right? Shifting it a little bit from just outright suppression to thinking, like longer term about mitigation um, and preparedness and the stakeholders that need to be involved in it. Northern California is a lot different than Southern California because of you know the density of their force. Um, they don't have the same urban populations that we do, the same um, number of people living in these wildland urban interfaces. Um, and, and then we, we're much drier, right? We have less water, we're, we're, we're in the, the drought like you know every seven, eight years. Um, and so our window to burn and do these cultural burns is much smaller. And then here in LA County, um, you know, we also have the regular air quality issues that are a part of you know, our way of living. So um, that becomes another a factor to, to, to configure. In Southern California, there are active tribal coalitions that are trying to work and start conversations with CAL FIRE, with the US Forest Service, with local fire jurisdictions. Um, as I said, I grew up in San Diego County. A lot of my work around this emerged from my own experience with my tribe. Um, and just working with then the Cleveland National Forest, um, and I know here in LA County, it's, it's even more difficult for tribes that maybe have that knowledge because they're not federally recognized, so they have extra hoops to jump through. Um, but I think if the conversation is being open, it needs to just be a wide, big, large table for people to come and sit at and, and share what they have. And then, you know, we're gonna create something that's new, but it's also a very old practice. Um, and I think if we can humble ourselves a little bit um, and think about sustaining the lifestyles that we have uh, in a meaningful um, and safe way, that it can be productive. But definitely the resources need to be, um, be leveraged so that more individuals that have this experience and expertise in our tribal communities can get trained, be red carded, understand the fire protocols and safeties that firefighters need them to know if they're gonna be 
putting fire on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and then likewise, there needs to be some sort of cultural competency training, I believe, for our fire practitioners and professionals that are out there so that there is a mutual understanding, a mutual respect, and that they can really truly collaborate and work together to solve this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also seems like some of the objectives, uh, when you compare the government objectives with uh, some of these cultural burners, the objectives also seem to be different. For the cultural burners, uh, much more, I mean, much more integrated into culture, spirituality, versus, uh, you know, uh, mitigating fire risk. And I'm curious, uh, there seems to be a tension there, absolutely. And I don't know if you have any experience talking to folks that are kind of, are trying to navigate that tension, keep keep relations good, and also know they have to end up in a place where there is more fire on the ground, like period. Again, it comes back to that cultural, I said religious difference, because a lot of, you know, the early part of the founding of this country was steeped in that, but it's really, you know, I guess a, a, another way to say it is like a philosophical way of looking at the world and the human relationship within it. So I think definitely it, it still is part, part of that problem because, um, fire practitioners, um, firefighters, people that are doing that work for public safety and good have a totally different paradigm that they're working from. And so it's getting them to see both sides of the coin. And definitely for Native people, as I said, fire has always been a gift, a tool, um, and we use it to create more gifts and tools that we rely upon. Um, and so I think sometimes understanding the cultural aspects that seem to have these spiritual connotations when you look at a grove of deer grass or, you know, you're trying to harvest choke cherries or, bring, you know, have a good acorn harvest, which are not guaranteed every year um, if they don't have fire, um, it becomes difficult because we just view the landscape in different ways. Um, and in our most native communities and languages, there's not a word for wild or wilderness because we're not, we would never saw ourselves as separate from it. Um, we are like the third iteration of life. Um, it was the land, the animal, you know, the land, the plants, the animals that came first, and those are our ancestors. And it's looking at our environment as relatives and not as resources and thinking about the way we interact as a responsibility and not a right or an entitlement. And it does require a big, a big shift. Um, but I think more and more people are seeing that and are curious about it and are wanting to support that action. And I think you know, I think it'll, hopefully, it won't start to manifest. Uh, Derek, you know, I, for all the firefighters out there who are battling these growing fires and all these different landscapes, putting their lives on the line for longer and longer periods of the year, I'm curious if there, if the current way of things, and we've talked a little bit about this, you and I, like, the current way of things is sustainable for them and what your worries are, especially when it comes to the workforce because they're, they're, not, they're not superheroes, I guess, at the end of the day. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that, uh, the toll that it's taking. Certainly, well, we're in an interesting time. When I, when I applied, when I got hired back in 1988, you know, the test I took the year before, we had 22,000 people apply for 600 jobs or so. Uh, in today's generation, it just seems as though we're having a hard time filling Great careers, great careers. Um, so we're having a hard time getting people to say, hey, you could have a great life doing this. Uh, so we're having a hard time getting guys into the front door, um, which means that the guys are there are having to work more because we are all risk. You hear us during the winter for the floods. You hear us obviously for the fires, which again, our Santa Ana's, and we have a high-pressure system today, you know, are year-round. Um, so it is taking a big toll on them. And, in fact, I had talked to a, a guy at my old station, and he says, you know, captains are still getting recalled five to eight times a month. Now, we work a 24-hour shift. We work, uh, we have three shifts. Each one works 24 hours, and then you're off, and then... You're supposed to have at least one day off in between, but we have guys that are working 10, 12 days because of the shortage from the front end. So it's impacting them, one, because you never get a good sleep yeah. in a fire station because you're always ready for the whatever you need to do. Um, so you yeah, have that stress that's just naturally there. And a little side note is everyone says, Derek, you look great. 
I'm retired now. I'm getting some rest, you know. <laughs> I go, it's not that I really look good. I just, you know, I, I feel better and I, I get sleep. Um, so, listen, it's just a generational thing. It's not an L.A. County thing. It's not an L.A. City thing. Across the board, fire departments, police departments, sheriff's departments are having a really hard time getting people to come to this career. So you have people that are already taxed because we can't get people coming behind them. My generation of guys that got hired, you know, we're all retiring now. And um, we're not getting a lot of people there saying, I want that job. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> if I could do it another 33 years, I would, uh, <laughs> seriously. Uh, and for all the toll that has taken on my body, I do it again in a heartbeat. Um, it's just trying to get that younger group of people mm -hmm. to understand that this is a good job. But how do you do that when the young guys are going, man, I haven't seen my wife and kids in two weeks? Mm -hmm. You know. And then now the season's coming around, and guess what? If we go on an out-of-county out incident, you're gone 21 days. And I never regretted any bit of that. I, you know, but I do understand the frustration mm -hmm. that guys are having, the guys and girls are having when, you know, they're missing birthdays, they're missing weddings, they're missing a lot of events. And so there's a lot, a lot of stress on these guys. And unfortunately, our suicide rate has really, really gone up, uh, really gone up. In fact, one of my uh, rookie firemen that I had when I first promoted a captain uh, just passed away. And... Um, how do you speak to that, you know? Um, because we all want to do our job and we want to do it well, and we look out for each other. But, you know, a lot of people have that pride and they, they take it home. And um, it seems to me that a lot of things here across the board are at a tipping point and that we need yeah, to, and yeah. that major change is needed. Um, and that, uh, to speak to some of the firefighter issues that you're also talking about, and prescribed burning, uh, to give you an idea uh, to add on to what Derek is saying, the Cal state of California has, like Cal Fire has about 130 people right now that can go out and that are like part of their prescribed burn crew. And that have to, you know, there's a potentially 30 million acres that need treatment in the state. Big fires are doing a little bit of that treatment in some way. But the workforce is so small that those guys then get pulled off, and women get pulled off to actually go fight fires. And so what's happening is that even the crew that is meant to go do that treatment is like then year round having to get pulled off to go do firefighting as well. Um, and so, you know, it definitely seems like a lot of things are at a tipping point. And I really appreciate all of you uh, sharing all of this. And so I am gonna get into some of these questions as well. Um, and, you know, uh, we can all do our best to try to answer them. Uh, so let's start with, um, <laughs> this is an interesting one. So what is the panel's response to the idea that we should focus on protecting lower income neighborhoods versus wealthy neighborhoods who have money for insurance? And that might be, I don't know, who's, who's going to try to answer that? That is an that. interesting question. I don't know who, an who asked that, um, but thank you. I guess it depends on what is... On the, uh, I, I didn't even know quite how to yeah. handle that question. Yeah, I don't actually. know either. I don't know. But yeah. maybe yeah, the sure. chief yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll take a shot at it. Yeah. Uh, across the board, the problem or the situation we have in front of us, we handle it accordingly. Your lot in life has nothing to do with our commitment and how um, deep we're going to go into saving you or your property. I would say the only difference is you'd find uh, more lower socioeconomic people in more urban areas. Although I can give you an example of Lake LA. Or the campfire paradise was a lot of yeah. lower. Uh, and lower and so yeah. with things like that, uh, people, poor people seek out what can best suit them. In some areas like in Northern California, the land's cheaper, they can put a trailer out somewhere and live off of some propane in a stream and survive. In Southern California, it's a little different 
you'll find mobile home parts or you'll find what we call lower socioeconomic places, places but they have running water and a home and a roof over their head and all that. As far as a higher income, listen, I worked 22 years in the toughest parts of LA County and I saw the best and worst of humanity there. And those guys, uh, my guys in my station, uh, we gave everything, no matter where we were. And the, um, and the, I, and then I worked my last 12 years in the Malibu, Westlake Village area. Um, you know, huge, huge homes. You take care of them all the same. You do the best you can for, uh, for whatever scenario you're encountered with. And and you're again, uh, your financial uh, status means nothing to us. But on the other hand. Yeah. So uh, you're making me think a little bit harder here. Um, it may be that people with much bigger houses and much newer houses that are building uh, more recently should pay more for their insurance than people who have been living like in paradise for a really, really long time, right? So if, if, you're, if you're bringing more hazard to a place because you have chosen to live in a place that's highly flammable in your big house, maybe you should internalize some of that additional cost in your insurance rates, right? Or building standards. Or building standards, right? So I think that that, that question could be taken in a number mm -hmm. of different ways. If, you're, you know, if you live in an old subdivision because that's the only place you could afford, you know, that's, that's kind of, you haven't had much volition in making that happen. But if you're an extremely wealthy person and you want to t live on the top of a mountain somewhere um, where, you know, it's really hard to get to for firefighting pur pur purposes, maybe you should be paying more for your insurance. So I do want to answer one of these questions where someone said, do prescribed burns ever get out of control? And I actually just looked up the stat, like we, you know, we figured out the stat like yesterday. And I think in California, it's less than 2%. Uh, and the U.S. Forest Service said it was less than 1% for them. You know, the thing, you know, a big one did get out of control in New Mexico. And they shut down prescribed burning like all over the place. And what I heard from, um, people that work for like the US Forest Service who were trying to go out and do burns, who wanted to go out and do burns, who had a burn window to go out and do, it was yet another major season loss to go treat that land. And regardless of whether they go treat that land, like you're gonna get a mega fire, like in a lot of these places. Like the mosquito, I, mean, I don't know if mosquito qualifies as mega fire yet, but there's the mosquito fire that is currently going on up in Northern California. And uh, one of the guys that I know that's there is a prescribed burn practitioner and uh, he's for the U.S. Forest Service, and like they missed a lot of windows, um, and now they're fighting fire right now. So it is uh, the burns don't often get out of control. But another big thing, and we talk about this in the podcast, is the issue of liability. It is very, 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 very difficult for prescribed burners in the state, prescribed burners or cultural burners, to get any sort of insurance to cover them in case something does happen. And that has been one of the major barriers. That, in addition to workforce. Uh, the amount of like uh, uh, cost of doing a burn that can be up to thousand dollars per acre, and uh, as well as a variety of other things like uh, we talked to the former head of Cal Fire. Here's all these teases for the podcast, and they'll be in the podcast. But we talked to the former head of Cal Fire, and he was basically saying that they at times, you know, uh, shut down burning for a lot of the state when fires bad, when weather's bad in one part of the state, because they are concerned that. Uh, a prescribed burn might escape elsewhere, even though it almost never happens. So we are making a lot of sacrifices to not do prescribed burning, um, in, in, uh, and we're still getting hit with the same fires. So I just wanted to, I wanted to address that, but I do want to um, uh, turn to you, Professor Greger, uh, which is uh, someone also asked, um, sorry, I'm pulling it up. So what type of compensation could be given to cultural burners as we ask for and implement their help? That's a really great question. <laughs> We're not always asked to be paid for anything yeah. with our yeah. cultural knowledge. We're just supposed to give it. But it's, you know, it's labor. It's, it's cultural knowledge and expertise. Um, wow, I hadn't really thought about that. I would say that most cultural burners would probably just ask for um, resources, you know, and opportunities to continue to do what they're doing. So maybe they need fuel, maybe they need to get those Nomex 
that you know jackets for their crew because they do practice fire safety as they're doing this work it's not just you know starting a fire in, in the in the forest and you know trying to keep it contained um, I think it would be practical I think they would also probably appreciate funding um, to feed people to pay for maybe fuel to get out there um, to hold trainings to teach workshops so that it can be the knowledge could be spread um, and the process could be sustained. I think a lot of it is, you know, we have these cultural knowledge bearers, um, and when an elder passes away, we lose that library of knowledge, right, and that wealth of experience. So I, I, I would guess, I, I'm not a fire practitioner. Um, I support all this work through nonprofit work and through my academic research. But I would say, you know, most people, that's what they're just looking for, a way to sustain their work, a way to sustain their programs, and to pass on the teachings, because that's what we do. We're intergenerational learners, um, and we learn through that combination of listening, hearing, and doing. So someone also asked, does a prescribed burn, we are, we are almost up on time, but someone did ask, how does a prescribed burn leave the landscape and plant life different than it was before? And of course, it depends on what ecosystem you are in uh, and what type of fire you're putting down. But when I was up in the Klamath area uh, witnessing a cultural burn, I had fortune, uh, good fortune to go out on one, um, there was this patch of land about, I think it was about 30 acres that they were set to treat. And the goal, because there's always an objective with a burn, there's also a humongous checklist and liability stuff that they try to figure out. Like a lot of work is done that goes into knowing exactly what we're doing on a certain piece of land. And for that piece of land, hadn't been burned in ages, and they needed to put high, as hot a fire as they could on the ground to clear out all of the leaves, old branches, but also to burn the hazel. And the hazel in that instance was um, when the hazel was burned, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong and get anything wrong, uh, it, the, basically the stalks tend to grow straight. And that, those stalks are then used for basketry and uh, for newborns, eating bulls, that kind of thing. Um, and so when they went there that day, one of the issues that came up was they, uh, you know, this huge group of people had been watching the weather, the relative humidity, all this temperature, all this kind of stuff. And when they went to actually go put fire on the ground, it was almost like too cool to, to burn as hot as they wanted it to. So they really had to throw, they actually literally throw gas and diesel onto fire on all these leaves. And it became an issue, like the sun was going down and it was a little too cool. And uh, I, I don't know if they burned it as well as they wish they would have. It seemed successful. Um, that said, and so basically by clearing all that stuff out, the hazel is gonna grow straighter. Uh, the moss uh, that will burn up on the tree will basically kill the bugs that are in that moss on that tree. And over time, the hope is that it will start to restore that landscape a bit more. Because right now that landscape is basically a monoculture of Douglas fir throughout that whole area because it was timberland and uh, you know, it's able to carry high severity fire. So um, it does make a big difference. And uh, the Fed, like I said, feds and the state and everybody is like very bought into it right now across the board. Um, let's see. So is, <laughs> this is not a big question at all to end on. We have like one minute. Is the obstacle to more prescribed and cultural burning right now more political? And how far are we from having organizations dedicated to it? Um, I can try to answer it if someone else would like to would like to answer it. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I think we have to kind of wrap up shortly. I could just say in San Diego County, I've, there are nonprofit organizations, coalitions um, that are trying to sort of cross pollinate and share information. Um, I was contacted, um, I should say my ex-husband works for the US Forest Service and he actually was a fuels battalion chief here for LA County for several years, um, but he's since switched positions. So everything you were saying about the checklist mm -hmm. and doing the burn plans, I don't think he did very many burns in his position because of weather and getting pulled to other fires. And it was a very frustrating job for him. But I know that there are folks who have retired and are working for these nonprofits or these coalitions, and they want to pass on their knowledge as well. And they want to get in touch with um, the native community to make the process easier for them to get their red cards and to kind of get integrated mm -hmm. into uh, fire response and So red and cards are the mitigation. things you kind of need to go do. Yes. The people that do these burns are called like burn bosses mm -hmm. that lead the burns. It's like a really cool name. 
And we actually just, we just, it's, it's in, we talk a lot about this in one of the episodes in the series, but there are major, there are major impediments right now to those folks getting qualified. Yeah, sorry. I, I'd like to add just one more yeah. point. Um, yeah. I also think it's a public education question. Yeah. So as was pointed out earlier, one of the issues in this region is air quality, right? And when you have a fire, you have very bad air quality. So the window of burning opportunities is very, very small. And the Air Quality Management District actually has to give you permission to burn. But at the same time, people where the burn is happening do experience the fire. They have ash, they have all this stuff falling from the sky, and it's very disturbing to them. And there's a lot of opposition to burning because of fear of escaping the escaping fire and also the consequences. So part of it is this re-understanding that needs to happen beyond simply just the people who do the burning, whether it's the educating more broadly about the value of this process and the meaning of it relative to restoring these landscapes to viability in, a, in the longer term. So I'd just like to add that to it because I think that part of it is often neglected and people just have a lot of fear because of, well, you hear it on the news all the time, right? It's kind of a fearful approach to fire, which is understandable and they've been very, very severe. But there's also this kind of human relationship to fire that's been since humans were able to make fire. That's a really long time. Um, and so we've kind of forgotten that, that intimacy of the productivity of fire that really, I think, is part of the dilemma that we're facing. So sorry. Really quick. Sorry. The um, USC Huntington Library History of the West has an ongoing project called um, The West on Fire. And it is about looking at how we shift the narrative of fear, um, but also to be prepared, you know, like is what you're saying. So there's also been conversations happening in the last couple of years um, with a group of scholars and community members as well to talk about how we start to shift and change our relationship with fire, as you were saying. Yeah, and there are certain areas um, that, and we explore this in the podcast, and I will, I will end with, I will end with this as we have to wrap up. But um, where there are people with homes in these areas that are going to extreme lengths to try to figure out how to have their home survive fire, and we actually went and visited one, and it was basically a, a gentleman. Uh, actually, he was a uh, he was a stunt man for ages and he uh, built a concrete bunker in Topanga Canyon. And it's essentially a giant concrete shell that he like tucked into the side of the mountain. And like everything is prepped exactly as every firefighter would likely say it should be. <laughs> and uh, went and hung out there and we explore it and try to understand it and uh, talk about it a bit. Um, and I will just say that any of you that have tried to build in LA County uh, yes, it was as difficult as you would imagine it to be. Almost as difficult as lighting a fire. Almost as difficult <laughs> as lighting a fire. And on that, I want to say thank you to Teresa Greger, Derek Bart, and Stephanie Pincel. Uh, thank you to the show's producers, uh, Minju Park and Natalie Chudnovsky. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, there's much more nuance to all of this stuff. I know we did get pretty deep tonight, and I appreciate it uh, about you know trying to change our understanding of fire and, and how we move forward. And I think that the answers are in a lot of this complexity, which uh, I, without without my, my colleagues here, we wouldn't be able to explain in a very clear way in this podcast. So I really want to say a big thank you to them as well uh, again. So uh, there are also practical steps that you can take. We have a whole episode with Derek as to how to, <laughs> very, very actionable advice as to how you can prep. Um, and yeah, second episode just came out. I think we have eight more. And again, uh, go subscribe, give it a download. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.